Hello everyone, welcome back to Asian of Gash, which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma. In today's video, we're going to look at the scenery table within the Age of Sigma rule set. How this table works is that you roll a single d6 for every scenery piece on the table, and then what number you roll, you match with the corresponding number in the scenery chart to see what effect that scenery piece will have for the rest of the game. This is quite often used in tournaments, it's a very simple way to implement a... Um, effect that scenery will give off and um, to give a bit of variety to those competitive games. So if you're planning on going to a tournament or if you just want to play um, in your store it's important that you learn at this scenery table. So the first one being damned and this is if you roll a one for that scenery piece before the game starts. So damned if any of your units are within three inches of this terrain feature in your hero phase you can declare that one is making a sacrifice if you do so, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, but you can add one to all hit rolls for that unit until your next hero phase. Okay, so this can sometimes be regarded as one of the best ones because um, there's a lot of units out there that can save against mortal wounds, or um, a popular one is Skyfires because they do, with their bows and arrows, they will do D3 mortal wounds on a six to hit. You make them sacrifice to this, they're getting plus one to that roll, so now it happens on a five, and then there's various other ways for them to plus to their hit roll. So um, it's good, and Skyfires, for example, they have four wounds apiece, so if they take D3 mortal wounds, and they're fortunate enough to take three mortal wounds, it won't kill one of them outright, so you'll still get the full um, shooting effectiveness of them that turn. And then there are things like um, good in combat, like you've got blood letters, of course that do mortal wounds on sixes to hit. Um, you've got spirit host, you've got what I commonly use as crit flares in my flesh eater court army. As they do mortal wounds on sixes to hit, they're chucking four attacks out each. You do this with them, um, get them to sacrifice, you take D for more wounds, you've got a chance to save it if you've got one of your flesh eater court characters within six inches of them, or a death hero if um, you're taking death grand alliance army. And so they've got a chance to save against these small wounds. But also, importantly, is that if one of them, like I said, they've got four wounds. So if they're already damaged and you sacrifice and one of them dies, if you've got a friendly courtier nearby for your flesh eater courts, you can bring back that model. So it quite often happens in games where I will sacrifice to this down terrain with my crit flares. I will sometimes sacrifice to two down terrains if they're both in range of me. And then quite often a model will die, but I will bring one back and I won't have suffered any wounds due to this because I've just brought back a model. So I've gained plus one to hit and haven't really lost any sort of um, effectiveness or haven't suffered any disadvantage. And I am, you know, at least plus one to hit, which doing more wounds on a five is really good. And when you like to say, if I do it twice, do mortal wounds on a four, which is just... Um, you know, to hit, which is really, really good. Doing more wins on a four, hitting on a two is, um, there's not much that will stand up against that. So, damn train for me is um, really good because I do take my flare army to tournaments a lot. So, if I'm, if me and my opponent are rolling to see what the terrain is in this game and we roll a one, meaning damn train for a lot of the senior on the board, um, already it's looking like a good game for me because, um, there's lots of ways for me to get pluses to hit, meaning that I can do mortal wounds easier. So for me, that's good. Like I say, for other armies as well, blood letters. Um, so corn, you know, you've got Zeech, you've got um, anything that really does special abilities on sixes to hit, or um, just simply do mortal wounds to hit on sixes. Um, down terrain can be really good for that. Especially if the enemy is somehow making you minus one to hit, like um, when I do sometimes fight as each army a lot of the time I am minuses to hit so being able to um, numb that ability by gaining pluses to hit um, really can sort of bring back your combat effectiveness because um, in games where I've been like in one tournament I was against a Sinesh army I was like hitting on sixes a lot of the time then I had to re-roll sixes because I was attacking demonettes so it was really hard to try and punch through and unfortunately there was no damn terrain on the board so I couldn't help myself out but if there was um, it would have just been so much nicer instead of being able to hit on sixes and re-roll on sixes to be able to hit on fives and sixes and it would have just 
really um, helped me out in that game. So that's Damn Terrain. Now moving on to the second one, which is Arcane. So this is if you roll a 2 for a scenery piece at the start of the game. This is the effect it will have. Add 1 to the result of any cast and on binding rolls made for Wizards within 3 inches of this terrain feature. So again, this is good. Um, it's Some of these terrain features can be um, bad as well. They're not all giving good positive abilities. So um, just having a nice one that you know you won't take any damage from or anything like that is quite good. Just simply adding 1 to your cast and on binding rolls. Can be very useful, obviously there's times where... Maybe you want to cast a Mystic Shield and you cast on a 6 and then a lot of times you roll 5, just getting plus 1 to that can really help you obviously to get the spell off. And um, also if you have, there's some spells out there, not too many, but they're like um, casting value, let's say 7, but if you get a 10 to cast, um, it will unleash a special ability on top of that. So getting add 1 to it is nice, especially when you're trying to cast like really hard ones. If you're trying to... Um, do Foot of Gork, for example, for the Orcs, which is um, pretty hard. They need to get at least a 10 on two dice, so being able to add one to it um, really does help. And also, the other half of Arcane is you get to add one to our Binding Roll. So if you're playing against a Zeech army, or um, what sounds to be like a Death army, as they are going to sound to be very um, good in the Magic um, department, being able to add one to your own Binding Rolls could really help you... Um, new to the enemy's magic, especially against these heavy magic armies. It's not going to help you out all the time, because if you play against a Demon of Zeech army, I believe the Lord of Chains command ability, or one of his abilities is um, you match, when you're unbinding or casting, um, you match the lowest dice to the highest. So if he rolls, if he needs to get, I don't know, an 8 to cast something, and he rolls a 6 and a 1, normally that would be a fail. However, he would match the 1 to the 6, so now that that's a 12, and then the spell goes off. Admittedly, it's going to be very hard for you to try and unbind that, but with plus one to it, you know, you've got a chance. And also, like I was saying, um, Mystic Shield is a common one, and a lot of people are unlucky managed to get it on a six, you know, it just goes off. And however, if you're going to try and unbind it if you're in range of that enemy wizard, and you get to add one to your roll, you only need to roll a six, you add one, it's a seven, you beat them. So, can be nice. Three inch range radius is a very common. Um, um, range for these scenery pieces for them to have effect, so that's all right. Especially a lot of people um, do this. I mean, I do it in my necromancer. I stick him in a arcane um, scenery piece, like quite often it's a forest, and um, he will obviously benefit from the adding one to cast and unbinding. But also, he'll get plus one to a save, so it's a nice little um, scenery on the board. That okay? So that's arcane. Now moving on to number three. Inspiring. Add one to bravery of all units within three inches of this terrain feature. Again, um, this isn't bad. This is pretty good. It might sound, you know, a bit boring compared to you know sacrificing D3 uh, mortal wounds and getting plus one to hit. But adding one to bravery, like um, I hope I've said in my previous videos, is so important. A lot of people um, don't think of the battle shot phase as being a um, big part of the game, and you know, like how. Um, almost you and your opponent are equal in the battleship phase because you know all the combat's done now you just roll in to see for each one of your units and if it runs away you know you can't affect each other you can affect each other very easily I mean um, my flare army again it runs on um, fear a lot of the time by making the enemy minus this to their bravery so for me um, if there's a lot of inspiring terrain on the board and particularly where the enemy is um, it can be very annoying because um, my flares have got a screaming attack where I roll a dice, I add one to it, and then the enemy unit that um, I pick to be affected by this screaming attack, which is a shooting attack. Um, so I roll a dice, add one to it, and the difference between that and their bravery is how many more wounds they take. Admittedly, a lot of the time this ability is useless, but since the Flesh Eater Tone Allegiance abilities came out. There's an artifact that makes enemy units within six inches of the bearer of this artifact minus two to bravery. And I often take this, I used to take on a Terra Glass, but now I take on a Vargolf. So I'm trying to find lots of ways to make the enemy minus this to their bravery. So if there's lots of terrain on the board that gives them, you know, plus one to their bravery, bear in mind this will stack if there's a lot of inspiring within range of this unit. Um, it can 
new to a part of my army what can do damage which can be annoying and um, as I rely on trying to um, hit them really hard and to um, deal as much damage as I can that hopefully the bash shock phase will um, almost wipe out the rest of their unit or to take away um, how effective it can be by them getting plus one to it can be quite annoying however from my point of view um, obviously if I've got inspiring in my side of the battlefield you know it's great I mean like if I've got a unit of 40 skeletons usually would have um, on that would have bravery 14 and now they've got bravery 15 with this so um, that's good even with elite things like if I'm running a unit of nine flares and then um, if five of them die they've got bravery 10 so in the battle phase I'm rolling dice on a six one of them runs away which um, can be annoying with these elite units so by having adding one to that it makes it a lot harder for them to run away so yeah it's a more sort of generic sort of one just adding one to bravery but it is good just of course depends on what side of the board it is as well as um, the arcane one as well for that matter okay so now we're looking at number four so deadly so roll a dice for each model that makes a run or charge move across or finishing on this train feature on a roll of a one the model is slain okay so like i said not all of these terrain features are necessarily good for you so this is um you know like the train is like a curse with magic or something and there's a chance that you know your soul can be ripped from you by entering such area you know little things like that basically so this can be quite devastating i mean i know for a fact um like if you're let's just say you're charging like a you know, 40 skeletons, let's say, through this terrain feature, um, you know, there's a good chance that a lot of them will die, you know, like um, one in six of them is going to die. So that's for hordes, so it can be devastating. Also for um, things like Draconian Guard, like um, I know someone who had a unit of four of them and he charged into the enemy. I can't remember what it was. I think it was Kern of Hunters at the time. But um, anyway, he charged into the enemy and... Um, he rolled a one for um, two of Draconian Guard because he had four of them in total. And because um, he rolled a one for two of them, two of those models disappeared because it was unlucky to um, roll that. So that is, that was really nasty. That was about 220 points just gone like that. So it can be pretty devastating. And what that means is that obviously you can take the risk and um, if you really need to get to the enemy, you really need to run to, you really need to get there quickly and then charge them the following turn. You have to take the risk, or if you have to charge the enemy through this, you have to take the risk. And quite often, um, deadly is used as a um, deterrent. So you put your um, hero in there, your supportive hero, or you put your um, shooting unit in there just to deter the enemy from charging you. Um, and that's how it's used a lot. I mean, like it's very similar, this deadly um, effect, compared to um, the Sylvaneth Wildwood. The only difference is Sylvan F. Wildwood doesn't, you can't, um, like heroes and monsters can't be affected by this, but the deadly one in this scenery chart can. So I've charged a zombie dragon across um, this scenery piece and I rolled a dice and on a one, um, yeah, it disappeared and that changed the whole course of the game. So you've always got to bear in mind what this piece will do. And like I say, it is, does sound very nasty, but if it's in your territory and you've got shooting in your army you can use this to your advantage um, by like I say deterring the enemy from charging you so it has got its benefits but you know just be wary as it is just as deadly to you as it is to the enemy right now we move on to number five which is mystical so roll a dice in your hero phase for each unit within three inches of this terrain feature on a roll of one the unit is befuddled and can't be selected to cast spells move or attack until your next hero phase on a roll of a 2 to 6, the unit is scrolled, and you can reroll failed wound rolls for the unit until your next hero phase. Okay, so this is like a double edged sword. Now, I tend to usually risk it with this ability, which can end very badly. And also, it's important to note that it's, um, it is compulsory. You have to roll if you have a unit within 3 inches of this terrain feature. You don't have a choice like with Damned, where you could sacrifice a unit. Mystical, you have to do it. And I generally 
tend to tr you know just risk getting used I mean like funny story is I had a um, terror guys were at point gawking on top of him and he was on the um, well he was next to the train feature and um, I thought right okay if he, this guy with the terror guys if he gets a six to wound with its jaws it does a flat six mortal wounds to the enemy unit it just attacked in the combat so I thought being able to re-roll failed wound rolls more chances of getting the sixes more chances of doing mortal wounds you know it's worth the risk you know I think I even said what's the chances of um, rolling a one for his mystical um, train ability anyway you know can do anything unfortunately he did roll one um, for the mystical train so that means he couldn't move cast spells um attack he could literally only make save rolls um which was annoying and then the next turn he rolled a one again because obviously he couldn't move so he had to stay where he was and then the next turn he rolled a one again he got this thing like three times or four times in a row which was um really unfortunate and this is the first time i was using him as well i was getting him ready for a tournament so unfortunately in that game the only practice i got was making save rolls for him when um my mate's bloodbound army just came crashing into him and absolutely destroyed him. So it is risky, you know, I mean, that was a very unfortunate event that, but if you get it off, you get to reroll all failed wound rolls, which is um, really good. I mean, we're talking about flesh eater courts. So you take a, let's say a lot of crypt rollers, have a ghoul king nearby, so they're rerolling hit rolls, and then make them pass the mystical train. And when I say make them pass, I mean, you know, hope they pass. And then they're re-rolling all failed hit rolls and all failed wound rolls, which is really, really good, especially how Crypt Horrors do um, free damage and they get sixes to wound. So, Mystical, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I was lucky enough to have a game on Warhammer Live once and with my Flesh Eater Court army, and I was playing against someone who was much more experienced than me in um, tournament play. So I thought, the only way I'm going to beat this guy is if I risk everything and surround my whole army around mystical terrain because in my side of the board there happened to be a lot of mystical terrain there. So I thought I'm going to risk everything, try and re-roll those wound rolls and you know, really play it to my advantage. Unfortunately the Dice Gods had other ideas where the Terror Geist failed um, and I think the you know, Nine Crypt Horrors failed as well and a Courtier failed so it really didn't go well but if it did go well uh, my army would have been that much more devastating so I don't regret it because you know it's a one in six chance and I didn't have six units around this mystical train so I thought the odds were on my side however they were not an important thing to note though is that you can do this um, rolling to see if you're befuddled by the mystical terrain in any point in your hero phase so I was under the impression first you have to do it Prior to the start of the hero phase, because you know the um, narrative behind this is, you know, like it's real sort of mystified. You know, it can sort of, you know, basically befuddle your units by confusing them, and then you know, like almost like sort of putting them in like a different time zone or something like that. Just um, you know, it's, a, it's an uncontrollable event in the story. That's how I looked at it. However, you can do it at any point throughout your hero phase. What I thought didn't really make sense to the narrative, but. It's good for gameplay because it means if you've got a hero there, you can cast, and he's a wizard, he can cast all his spells, he's got command abilities, he can do the command ability, and uh, any other abilities he's got in the hero face, he can do that, and then roll, and then if he fails then, at least he's done all his um, hero face abilities essentially. However, if you've got units within range of this mystical, I would tend to, as long as they're not attacking in the hero phase, I would tend to roll for them first because you know if they are unfortunately befuddled not to stack um, loads of abilities on them because they're not really going to be doing much that turn anyway apart from making save rolls so um, mystical is a is a tricky one it's I heard a lot of tournament players a lot of high-end tournament players stay as far away as they can from mystical just because they can't foresee what it's going to do and it's just an extra risk they have to think about so there is that. I I look at it as that might be true. It might be best to try and avoid it just to be safe. But it adds a bit of fun, you know. I mean, yeah, sure, you might get a one and your unit can't do anything. And it just feels, you know, gets you down a little bit. And you think, oh, that's annoying. But if you get, you know, a two or more and one dice, 
that unit, it just became so much more effective. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a risky one. And another reason why I do it in tournaments as well, why I place units around Mystical, is because your opponent is not expecting you to do that, because he thinks there's no way you're going to take that risk. So if you do take that risk, you throw them off guard a little bit, and admittedly it can go wrong, but if, it, if you're lucky and it goes well, um, you can really give them a good shock. So that's mystical. I just read it again because it is a bit of a long one. So it's um, so when you roll to see what the scenery piece does, um, mystical is a five at the start of the game. And then in the game, roll a dice in your hero face for each of your units within three inches of this terrain feature. On a roll of a one, the unit is befuddled and can't be selected to cast spells, move or attack until your next hero phase. On a roll of a 2 to 6, the unit is enscrolled, and you can re-roll failed wound rolls for the unit until your next hero phase. So it is a bit of a long one to read, but as I've just explained the effects, it does play a big part in the game, especially how just by chance it happens to be on a really big terrain feature right in the middle of the board that affects equally you and your opponent. Okay, the next um, one, if you roll a 6 for that terrain feature, it becomes sinister. So sinister. Any of your units that are within three inches of this terrain feature in your hero phase cause fear. Until your next hero phase, subtract one from the bravery of any enemy units that are within three inches of one or more units that cause fear. Okay, so essentially, um, the scenery piece is scary. Um, if you've got a unit next to it, it makes the unit scary, and it minuses one to the enemy's bravery if they're within three inches of a unit that's been affected by Sinister. So it can be good. Um, it really depends what it, it, where it is on the board. I mean, if it's like right in the corners of the board or on the edges of the board, depending on obviously the battle plan, um, if the objectives are in the middle of the board, it's not really going to come into play that much. However, if the Sinister is in the middle of the board where a lot of the combat's happening, um, it can often make a constant minus one to the enemy's bravery and sometimes yourself. And I'm a big fan for when this is rolled for for a scenery piece with my flare army. As I explained, it works a lot on fear. It has um, abilities that affect the enemy depending on their bravery. So any ways to make the minuses to that bravery um, really does help me out. So it's good. It's a little bit harder to manage because you have to try and keep a unit within three inch of it to, um, in your hero face. So you'll get it into your next hero face. However, if you've got, let's say, you've, um, I've got a terror guys next to it, and in my hero face, so till my next hero face, they'll make the enemy minus one bravery if they're within three inches of it. But I move him away from the train feature, like a good 14 inches, so he's, you know, he's left that far behind. And then um, we roll for priority, and it's my turn again. And then I move the terror guys, and I charge him. He does some damage and attacks because if he attacked the enemy on the second turn where he was 14 inches away from the terrain feature, he's no longer benefiting from the Sinister. So if you have an army that works on trying to make the enemy minuses to their bravery, it's quite good if you can try and centralise the combat around these scenery pieces, especially if you're a deaf army, like I say, of my flares, my terror guys, because I'm personally not worrying too much about the battleship phase and not nearly as much as my opponent and also their bravery. So, um, Sinister, it can be good, it's, like I say, it just depends where it is on the board, like, to be honest, a lot of these um, scenery abilities, and, um, yeah, and also it depends what your army is, if you're not bothering about uh, making the enemy minuses their bravery so much, because, you know, you don't have many abilities that take advantage of that, or um, if you've got a really high bravery army, like, you know, bravery 10, um, and the enemy's got, you know, bravery 10, and you think, you know, it's not going to play much effect, um, you're going to ignore this um, scenery piece a lot of time. I mean, obviously, you've got to, you know, still play with the rules for it, but you're going to um, not try and implement it so much in your gameplay. So, that was all six of the um, abilities for the scenery, what you roll for at the start of the game. So, I'll go through them quickly again. So... If you roll a 1 for a scenery piece, it's damned. If you roll a 2 for a scenery piece, it's arcane. If you roll a 3 for a scenery piece, it's inspiring. If you roll a 4 for a scenery piece, it's deadly. If you roll a 5 for a scenery piece, it's mystical. And if you roll a 6 for a scenery piece, it's sinister. So, 
Damned is where you can sacrifice D3 mortal wounds and you get plus one to hit. Arcane just adds um, one to any of the cast in or unbinding rolls. Inspiring adds one to bravery. Deadly is if you run or charge through this terrain feature on a level one, that model is just slain. Mystical is where you roll a dice. You have to roll a dice for each one of your units from three inches of the strain feature. And on a one, they can't do anything until the next hero phase. But on a two or more, they can re-roll failed wound rolls. And then Sinister makes your units within three inches of the strain feature scary. It's also important to note that a lot of these abilities, apart from Deadly, because that's obviously you just run and charge for it, are if you're within three inches of the terrain feature. So depending on what the feature is, it can be quite a big radius, especially if it's on one of those um, forest spaces which are used as Sylvaneth Wildwoods for some people. Things like that can be good. For Realm Gates, it's not so big, but still a three inch radius, it can affect quite a bit depending on where it is on the board, of course. So, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like quite a lot, but if you honestly go on the um, Age of Sigma rule page, because there's only, you know, four pages, you can download it from the website, um, and it doesn't take long to read through it, and it really does um, let you know on extra things from the game. Even if you've been playing for a long time, um, like I have since Age of Sigma started, um, I didn't read the full rule set until about a year ago, or, you know, probably even about nine months ago or something, and there's a couple of things um, that I realised when I read through it, and going, oh right, so yeah, so that's exactly how that happens in the shooting phase, and then that's how you target the enemy precisely like that, and in which order it happens, so it can be very useful, so I definitely suggest you reading the scenery table, get a better understanding of it, and like I say, if you're planning on going to any tournaments, or um, just in general having a lot of games, it's important to um, learn the table rather than you having to look up to see what it does because if you're having to constantly refer to what what does you know mystical do um, and you get out you know your book and you know you look at the back of the book to find out what it does you're not understand you're not understanding how to use it in the game you're not um, you know taking advantage of that ability you know the ability it gives right if you're having to refer to it every time you cross that bridge. Um, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice, especially how the enemy, your opponent, is probably going to know what all of these do. So um, it's very important. Also, um, the scenery in Age of Sigma, you don't have to use the chart. I'm just telling you this because a lot of tournaments do and a lot of regular games do. A lot of people just use it as any scenery piece of your whole units inside of it or the whole model. Um, you get plus one to your save, which is a very easy basic way to use it um, that still works with the scenery table by the way so if your models in it you do get plus one to your save however the scenery table adds an extra level to the sort of tacticalness of the landscape because if you compare um, a lot of you know let's say 40k tables compared to age of sigma tables the 40k table has loads of buildings and like say a lot more going on and all that sort of thing age of sigma tables can look quite flat in comparison but there is a lot going on there because the train adds so much more to the game than you can realise. Like, um, There's been times where I feel like I've lost the game because um, I'm, a, let's say, I'm winning on victory points at the moment because I've controlled the most objectives and I only have one left and I just need to hold it for one more turn. Unfortunately, it's the enemy's turn and they're about to charge in a horrendous unit to wipe my unit off it and take it and win the game. However, their unit happens to be within three inches of a mystical terrain feature. So... Um, and they've rolled a 1 in the past and then that unit can't move and then my literal, like, I think it had like 10 ghouls or something on this objective were saved and because um, that was the opponent's last turn and I won the game so it can add so much to the game just by um, implementing these little things like I say, a lot of them only have a 3 inch radius around these terrain features but when you're playing with, you know, like 8 terrain features on the board that is a very large area that's going to affect things you know, more things, more units on the board are going to be affected by terrain than not affected by terrain, essentially. And especially in tournaments where terrain is a big thing. Like, if you go up to Warhammer World, um, there's always loads of fantastically painted terrain on the board, which um, people make the most of. They um, learn this scenery table and then they use it to their advantage in the game. So if you don't do the same, like I say, you put yourself at a disservice. And it's just like another um, handicap you're doing to yourself. 
So um, that's that, that's the scenery table. If you do like to play more narratively, which um, I'm a fan of as well, you can use um, the actual like scenery rules for every single um, scenery piece, like um, the Ophidian Archway, for example, has a special rule, you know, a Realm Gate has um, special rules where they have their own war scrolls. So um, there is that if you want to play more narratively. Um, that does add even more to the game than the scenery table. However, that's not often used in competitive and tournament games. Um, so the scenery table is more of a, a general use. That's why I want to um, tell you about this one first. And the um, if you're using the war scrolls for the scenery, it can be very good. Just bear in mind it can slow down the game a bit more because there's so much rules to them. Whereas the table is just nice and simple. Um, most of the scenery pieces only have a like a sentence or two just explaining what they do for the um, table. So that's been the scenery table. I know it's been a little bit different compared to the last videos I've done, you know, talking about death, but it's just because that death book is coming out um, this Saturday, you know, whoop whoop, can't wait until that comes out. But if I do more videos on death before then, like I know I was saying I was going to talk about the death lords and their leaked war scrolls, but I think it's just going to be better if I wait until the book comes out because then we have the full picture of how the rules are going to work in the game and how they're going to synergize with the other things in the book. Like if I was to look at, I don't know, um, Arkan the Black, let's say, and let's say like he's, some of his abilities have changed and all that sort of thing and now he's like, I know he doesn't get plus one this casting when he summons a deaf unit, but summoning for deaf units has changed and we don't completely know how it's going to work. Yes, we know they're going to come from grave sites, but we don't know exactly what points they're going to use and so on. So I don't really want to judge like Arkan the Black, for example, saying like, oh, his summoning capabilities have got worse because we don't know how summoning's going to work. So that's just like a little example. I would rather, you know, give my review on the book when we have all the information here to hand in our very own hands to be able to look for it. And um, like I say, in that book, I plan on doing... <sighs> A considerable amount of video as well, as many as I can, you know, about, I want to talk about the law in it, I also want to talk about, of course, some war scrolls, I want to go over them properly now that I can actually have them in a nice printed book where they're not so blurry, the print would be nice to read, I also want to go through um, the different legions, you know, the Legion of Blood, the Legion of Sacrament, the um, Legion of Night, and the Grand Host and the Gash, I want to go through all of them, compare them to the Legion's abilities of the current, um, death fractions and then also do in-depth um, look at the battalions because what I've noticed is that not all battalions but quite a few battalions if they're mentioned in um, videos on YouTube and stuff are um, quite often they're just generalised they just say like um, like if I was to look at um, the Gore Chosen Battalion like if some people would speak about it they would say um, it's very good, you know, basically it extends your radius for your blood to create a banner up to at most 36 inches for the portal skulls and then your slaughter priest can, you know, re-roll failed prayer um, rolls and they would say that's very good and then they would move on to the next corn battalion. However, I want, you know, talk about why is that good, what army, what armies it's good at, you know, how to make the most effective of it, you know, how to deploy it to make the most, most out of it, when to move it, when not to move it, just basically go in depth and, um, there are people who do that, definitely, of course, but um, I um, personally, for me as well, I'd like to look for all the deaf ones and stuff and think how to make the most of it. Hopefully that video, looking at the battalions, will take a while because um, I'm hoping there's going to be quite a few battalions, personally, myself. So, um, yeah, that would be good. So, like I say, uh, I'm not going to try and focus too much on deaf before the book comes out because I don't want all the information I've just given you... Um, about those potential videos go to waste if the book just contradicts everything I say. So uh, I'll wait for the book to come out, I'll do my videos on it and we'll give a really in-depth look. So after that um, conversation at the end of the video there, well it's nothing to do with the scenery table but um, I just thought I'd add it in. I hope you've enjoyed this video and if so please like, comment and subscribe as all that really helps me um, produce more videos and try and get one up um, most days of the week is my sort of target. And um, this really helps grow the channel. I'm really happy how the channel's gone. Um, it's really good. I mean, at the time of recording, I've got 83 subscribers, which is really good in comparison to what I thought I'd have when I started this channel and the amount of time it's been going for. So I'm really happy 
with um, how the progress has gone and also, you know, to everyone in the community, how much you've um, supported the channel and your comments and your likes and um, the subscribers as well, you know, you've all um, done really well. So really grateful for, for you for that. So until next time, the gash is all and all is one in the gash. <laughs>